Hello everyone, welcome. This is huge. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> it's great to see a lot of old friends. Hope to make some new ones. It's great to, to be here again. It's great to be the last speaker. Um, so this is not a JavaScript talk. Um, I realized this might be a bit softer topic that I'm used to. I've got some code in, but it's more, just want to share some ideas with you guys. For those of you who don't know, um, I'm Kenneth. I've been here a few times. I like speaking. Hopefully I don't waste people's time. I'm involved in the startup, Validation App. Just started another one to kind of get it up from the ground. Zero One, bespoke software dev. Uh, it seems we need students, uh, taking errands in. Um, I'm Kenneth Kelmer everywhere. I don't have any other presence online. So the backstory to this talk is this Ruby Rogues episode 186, what we <coughs> actually know about software development and why we believe it's true. And who, else, who listened to that episode? Everybody else listened to it. Um, it was really such an eye-opener. Um, these guys do some real science in designing computer languages, and it's actually appalling how we call ourselves engineers and we don't act like engineers. So since I listened to this episode, my head's been spinning, and I was trying to think, what can we do to act like engineers? Like, we are eternal optimists. We don't handle errors in our code. Our code will always run. We depend on airbrake, rollbar, hoptoad, sentries, whatever these apps are, to keep track of errors for us, and we kind of react. Um, if we do Ajax calls from our fancy single page apps, who implements error handlers that often? Um, so it's like we just, it works, and it especially works on our machines. <laughs> if you guys were watching some of the fast tweets, there was a brilliant picture from the Pulp Fiction, Samuel L. Jackson, like, say, it works on my machine one more time. <laughs> I tried to recreate it, but the Samuel L. Jackson pixels were, like, they were too small. It wasn't doing it justice, so I left it out. <laughs> so we, we trust our guts. Um, it's like, I love that, like, hindsight's the only 2020 vision. But somehow we just keep on doing the same things over and over again. So the stuff that does work, we just repeat. We don't question it. And it takes somebody like Sandy Metz to come around with a few simple rules to really shake things up. And then we start listing and we're like, oh, there's something we can do. Or we throw a gem in our code, the sandy meter. And we're like, this thing starts failing our CI. I, I like that idea, but like, yeah, I don't know. It's just we get stuck in our ways. And then those of us are just like, we've been doing this for long. We just roll with it. We know like that burns. It's the whole like, monkeys don't pull that either. You know, you'll get water sprayed on you. You won't get food. <laughs> and we just pass that on. I kind of like this one as well, so I was looking for good quotes on, on hindsight, and this kind of like the loss of certainty, the book it just rang for me. So I was trying to think, how do, we, how do we change that? And Aaron helped so nicely frame a lot of the things I've liked. It's actually saving me some time. I found this from Peter Drucker. It's like, what gets measured gets managed. And there's tons of stuff. I mean, we use step counters, our phones, like these go processors, or it's Fitbits, and it's RunKeeper, and it's this and this, that. This morning I did like, one of my fastest runs in a long time because I measure it. But we don't measure our own code, or do we? So we, use, we throw New Relic at it, or Skylight. Or any other thing that we can just throw at. Liberato is awesome for infrastructure and everything else, and Nachios and cacti and its RRD files. And it's... But can we really answer the questions? Like, do we get the, the answers out there that we want? And I started thinking, how can I find a good use case just to, to, to set this up? And I was thinking, microservices. Um, well, I was reminded it's microservices. I won't call it SOA, like the name changes every week. Or it could be SOAP, or it could be REST, but we tend to building systems that chat all over. 
at work there's a system that chats to six or seven other systems to pull up things together to build dashboards for people. It's not very uncommon. I mean, eBay, we know, like you browse, that they've got a gazillion services behind doing pricing and recommended products. You know, this whole thing feeds together. So, like, we're happy. We, we, HTTP, everything. <coughs> Nothing can be more than 100 lines of code in total when we need to deploy it. But then the challenge is, set a network timeout on your HTTP calls. Who does that? We just throw Faraday, or HTTP body, net HTTP, at it. We don't know. Whatever the timeout is. So two minutes for a TCP timeout, give or take. So we optimize things work. They always work. So it's, it's fast, we're like, okay, no, it will be faster when we deploy it from my machine to this API, and I'm on 3G at home. It's slow. Like, it will be better on Amazon, because everyone's on Amazon. Well, we're in the neighborhood. So it's like some people expose some performance data for us. We can use this to build, or like to set our timers. If you were talking to GitHub for some reason, um, you can use that data. You can go, okay, 32 milliseconds, like that's good. So you can start setting a reasonable timeout on your code. But they just saved you the trouble. They took the guesstimates out. You're still challenged with, do you do 64 milliseconds? Do you double it? Like on a low number, that's not bad. But what if it's an API that takes 1,072 milliseconds to respond? Like, do you go make that now a two-second timeout? And how do you account for variability? Like, I took this screenshot a few seconds later, and I did the guilt. The stream API is more than twice as slow. Suddenly, the current performance, the home timeline is 40% slower, but the friend ID service is 100 milliseconds faster. So, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> back to square one. So each service has hugely different characteristics, and the reason we would split things up is to separate these concerns. So you would have services that are lightning fast and other that are insanely slow. And then even in the same service, different endpoints can give you different characteristics. I didn't want to caption it, <laughs> but you simply don't just set a network timer. We need to measure. And Aaron showed how you use like highly invasive tools like StackProf and there's RBProf and a ton of others among group data's great work there to really get in there and get a handle on what's going on. But that's not something you can deploy to production. But Rails has given us active support notifications. It's been there. Oh no, wait, Ooh, I'm dropping it. Ruby has us covered. We have the benchmarking. And Aaron showed that in this slide, like nice output. Save me from building, I can actually delete some things here. But you, you can get an idea of how long somebody, something took to run. User time, CPU time, like wall time. But that's difficult to parse. You need to do your own formatting around it and sculpt little reports. And that's great locally when you've isolated a problem and to get in there and, and figure out what's going on. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's knowledge to parse, it's tricky to scale. So now how do you start dropping in all these benchmark blobs everywhere in your system? And, and get that data out and get it back to the teams to make decisions with that data. So active support notifications, it's been in there for a while. I actually don't know when it went in. I was late to the party. But it's Rails uses it. Very, very, very simple. Um, you can hurt yourself badly if you do it, but it's a nice little pub sub pattern. Instrument something somewhere in your code, and then where you listen and gather the data, you do you get that somewhere else. So the instrumentation looks exactly like the benchmark code. It's just active support notifications instrument. You give it a name. Um, I threw in an empty hash so it fits on the slide. But you can pass a ton of extra options for some context. You do something. This thing will benchmark your code for you, and you can catch that data somewhere else. And that's when we can subscribe um, to different patterns. You can subscribe into Rails' internals already. Action controller, active record, action view, 
the caching, there's a ton of stuff that Rails already emits that you can just simply grab on and report if you want to. There's a lot of data, but for me, I just wanted to show duration. So you've got this, like the milliseconds there, that's kind of, in the end, what you want. And back to our HTTP challenge, Faraday's got a piece of middleware. It's like just one line that you can drop in, and it will get in deep in the HTTP request and suddenly sample up all these valuable numbers for you that you can just grab. So you can get every request that made the URL, the method, duration, yeah, just send it to the Rails blogger as an example. But this is how you can start collecting data for all these APIs that you're talking to and start figuring out how to do, how to set the specific network timeouts that you need. But that only gets us part way there. We need to visualize or store, report this data. It can't just live in a Rails log file. It's still the passing problem. It's still the sharing problem. It doesn't leave our production environment. So there's two tools I've been keeping my eyes on lately, just been playing with it. I mean, they're not exclusively the ones with solutions. One is InfluxDB uh, from Paul Dix and a few other guys. I mean, a lot of you guys should know Paul Dix from FeedZera and a few other things he's done. He's been prolific in our community. Um, so it's an open source distributed time series database with no external dependencies. Like it's really, you need to install or add get one dev file. It's written in Go, I believe. So it's static. Grafana is a nice dashboard. It can read data out of Graphite, um, out of InfluxDB and OpenTSDB. I don't know who's ever tried to set up Graphite with StatsD, with this whole chain, the whole like Etsy monitoring decision making. That's that's a pain. There's very few hands and they kind of go off. I know I've tried several times and I just throw it away. I, it's just too much work. If, you, if you've got a DevOps organization, people to support you, that's a, an amazing set of tools. But I think if us, we have a lot of small teams, a few guys are focused and clients are shouting at us the whole time uh, and we need to get stuff done. So these two tools work really, really nice together. I mean, I've got it going very, very quickly. Uh, this is just some screenshots. This is any time series data. This is not real specific. So you can just throw stuff in there. Grafana can graph all kinds of stuff. This is right off their website demo. I've been looking at other screenshots people made. It's insane. Customizable dashboards. You can have stuff for management here. Every time somebody signs up to the system, just write the data. You can draw. Everybody can kind of, you can surface numbers. That's important for the business. But it introduces dependencies. We don't want too many dependencies. Find a great Docker image, <laughs> two term flash influx DB. It's so light and it just works. It's a great way to start testing and it kind of de risks this operation. If you want to start looking, if you can, if these things are valuable to you, this is great to start. And if you actually want to take it live, you can just look at the Docker file to see how they deploy it. If you don't want to use Docker, and get it going. But the binaries are there, it's in Homebrew. It's really easy to get going. Rails, there's an InfluxDB Rails gem, which just basically sets up the client for you, hooks into Rails and subscribes by default to a ton of stuff that comes out of Rails. So you kind of get new Reddit for free, um, which is kind of great with a long tail. If you're already using StatsD in your network, there's a back end for InfluxDB that you can just install and you submit data straight into that so you can start comparing that with whatever other system you were using in the past or to decide if it's worth a switch. Uh, Stats test and fantastic. I mean, I knew it was there. It always, like, I never really got it working because I never got this graphite set up working the way I wanted. And then I just discovered a very interesting thing. It uses UDP, which I knew, but I never really thought about it. So Rails writes into StatsD over UDP. It gathers, rolls up the numbers, and submits it to whatever backend you're using. And I figured out it's because if StatsD is down, your Rails app doesn't block. It just, these packets go into the ether. It's like a small little, somebody also thought about this measured low impact. So, Influx and Grafana together can give us a lo fi RP. We need a relic really gets deep in your code. <laughs> it's amazing what that product can do, but for a lot of teams it's prohibitively expensive. And especially if you want to deploy over a lot of different services over a lot of different boxes it can quickly become a killer and you have to start fighting with their salespeople to try and work something out. They don't understand 
how expensive dollars are for us. Um, especially when you want to maybe use something else, you have a very limited spend on another thing that might be useful for your team. So you run a free one, you've got, what, seven days worth of data and it's generally, well, useless. So now you've got unlimited data, well, virtually, you've got a storage concern, where you can build up and you can start checking business metrics as well. So there's opportunity here to get buying from product owners. And high fidelity stats aren't always, you get lost. There's too much shininess. Where's the numbers that you actually need? And maybe the coarse grain is like, I don't know, it can just, it, it can easily be too much. And it's difficult to share. And you'll end up zooming out most of the time to make sense of it. So a lot of that resolution is just gone. So that's what I like, like, do just what you need out of your monitoring. And with low files, it's easier to share. And I'm, this one I'm kind of bringing up, because especially with the SIA and the microservices and companies with teams building their own APIs, um, we shouldn't assume that this, the team behind the API we're using are measuring stuff the same way we are. So we've gone down this path, we're starting instrumenting stuff, we're reporting different areas. That means if we trip up an error on their system, they give us a 500. It's not to say that they've got error reporting, because they're just as optimistic as we are. Like we like, love saying they're the guys that built the horrible soap thing. But in the arts, they're still just the same optimistic that things work. They chose their tools. So it's easy if you've got an internal dashboard that you're not restricted on the seat count and you can get people to start looking at stuff. They can still, maybe if they've got monitoring, they can correlate it. Maybe they're measuring it wrong. Maybe we're measuring it wrong. Who knows? But we, as a consumer of an API, you're kind of on the right side to do, measure the experience. So GitHub says 32 milliseconds. That obviously doesn't include the wire time. Or people are doing a lot of requests that can be like served out of cache. Like it's like, oh, and they say mean time, so it's like, like stats are so easy to lie with. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, engineering is creeping in everywhere. The work Aaron did with adequate record, that's all, and like everything else he showed is measured. Like that's engineering. It's just applying science and it's collecting evidence and thinking critically instead of working with our guts. Uh, Charles has worked with JRuby stuff. I love seeing all the charts every time there's new stuff and the new side VMs. You think 9,000 is coming, but there's another thing running on the side again that I can't even remember the name. And it's just chart after chart after chart of like decisions fueled by empirical evidence. That's powerful, and we all benefit from that. So we can we should do the same. The, there's a blog post on the vigor.com blog. I'm just using double quotes. I mean, people get can get religious <laughs> about the whole single quote, always double quote for interpolation, ends up making no difference whatsoever. And they benchmark it over, over, and over again. And yeah, it's just, just use double quotes. It's easier for us to pass. We don't need to, to think. I don't know if that holds for other languages and other VMs, though. And then on one big fluke, I forgot the author's name, he did this amazing, experimentally verified whether you should render on the server side or the client side, based on this whole Twitter, whoa, what am I doing? Uh, Twitter, the most went to single page, client side, and went back to the server side, and everybody was like shouted in uncertainty. But I mean, for them, it was very, very specific. They measured and they published it, but people seem to forget it, mean time to tweet. And their simple thing was people log in to tweet, and they log out on the website. So why, that's what they wanted to get the fastest. I mean, well, everybody like just started burning stuff down. No, single page apps are dead. This, it's that blog post, find it. Um, I'll tweet the link, it's insane now. This guy, same thing, measures and unpacks. And it ends up for most apps, it makes no difference. Either way. Generate the ERB templates on the server, ship them off one page or another, or just send that whole bundled up indoor Angular app in one shot. That's fine. And it can be your work here too. So the stuff I'm talking about is more like trendy, long-term measurements of stuff that you can make decisions on. But there's all these great tools that sit there right now. Once you notice a trend or a leak in your code, you can jump in with StackProf, RBProf. There's a lot of them, and it's come a long way. I mean, a few years ago, we added use, it was Bleak House. I remember, that thought, yeah, Bleak House. It was this weird patched Ruby that you install as a gem, but meanwhile it's downloading 
a patched interpreter of the same version of Ruby that you're using installs this it was a nightmare. And that is what we had. Now we've got the object space stuff. We've hunted memory leaks in Prom using the JVM tooling with JRuby. We can get with the Eclipse memory analyzer. So we can all draw charts and collect numbers and make the world a lot, a lot better. So this is my message to you, is to stop gut-driven development. We have the tools that we can collect evidence. And from this evidence, we can actually sit down and we can think critically. And we can make real decisions that can take and propel us forward. Much in the same way that we've benefited from all the hard work of other people doing this exact thing, we can start benefiting the systems we work in, the people we build systems for, their experiences, and make it better through like a little bit of the scientific method. Thank you very much. Whoa, Whoa. Okay, I flew through my time. There's five questions, really. Is there a real graph? Uh, no, it's not an actual graph. <laughs> I'm here often, maybe not in Cape Town, but you can laugh now. Uh, okay, so the question is, how often do we do before, when somebody complains? No, I mean, like if somebody doesn't complain, and it's the same, I guess, like sometimes, so somebody needs to raise the issue. And if you don't have some kind of data to go back on, you don't know where to go looking, because the nice thing if you've got like trained data over time, you can even pick up, oh, it was the time that the server was failing, we did migrate, okay, that's okay, or some cron job backup blocked up the database server, that's why we were slow, Mr. Client, sorry, or you just go, okay, wait a minute, we can see an increase of something, response times are going up, you can start doing git by set, but it's when people complain. And I don't know, I've never liked setting up all kinds of monitoring and alerts around it, it's people's experience. Um, so. And if you engage with your clients, whether it's another team or a user or something, you can get a feel for what's actually going on. Again, it's guts. Like, that person might be very, very happy on their iPad, on their 3D dongle in Bloemfontein. Like, that it works for them. Um, but somebody that's, like, used to a JSC high-frequency system will freak out. And then you can gauge and actually figure out what's going on. People don't, don't really tend to give you the right thing. Stu? Do you have any uh, secret ninja advice for, uh, uh, I guess, measuring aggregate things? Things that, you know, because we all measure it like new relic free and all these other plugins and stuff that, you know, you get your milliseconds and your CPU and RAM and, you know, stack traces and things like that. But when it comes to building, building sort of software working with, with an organization that you don't understand, is there any measuring things, aggregates of other things that mean something like you said, the mean time to tweet, you know, that's a key aggregate of the key. Do you have any advice on how you approach gathering those kinds of aggregates? <laughs> if it's a user experience, I think we step away from the speaker. <laughs> if it's a user experience thing, I would almost use like Google Analytics events um, or mix panel or something, because they've got that, you can track the flow that people go through a funnel if you know it's there and then you can like determine on and they can set goals. So you can probably roll that up yourself the same with time series and if you label it and you can identify individual sessions that you can track somebody in that but that's so much work. So part of why I pitch just these two tools, it's so easy to get going. And if we've got Google Analytics in our apps, just make sure you're in like you're either reporting the events if you've got a full page app or you can specify goal funnel. They've done this work because it just applies to so many websites that you can do it that way, that it's out there, you can make the decisions based on that. Um, I love that they visit the flow tool, it's amazing. I love seeing like, where people are dropping off and then you can figure out, if you combine that with a tool like, like Intercom, where you can actually, from an email address, get a lot more information about who a person is based on their social, like all their public knowledge online, these people aggregate for you, so you can actually 
oh, they're coming from this point of view. Um, like, there's a few things you can fall to people off easily, but then get in touch, mail people, and say, like, yeah, at least I know you tried. Why did you not go through? Sometimes it's purchasing issues, pricing is wrong. There's, so that side kind of goes very soft and leaves our realm. But specifically, analytics, goal tracking is great for that high level thing. If it's just normal metrics you're doing and you want to roll up different things, like, I'm just trying to think of a good example. So I got lost in InfluxDB and just its query language, and I've like, had to rip, I didn't want to talk to me about a SQL like language over time series data. But they also have some fantastic, if you have enough data in that you can start asking these questions up, it's got all the functions for you. And Grafana also, it's got editors for graphs to pull things up. And it's easy to query as well the influx clients. So, so even that workers and stuff. So you could quite do something if you're running on Heroku, measure your workload and start spinning up more dynamics in response to a workload based. And as, as it goes, like start shutting down. Um, or if you've got it, you can like spawn up new EC2 instances or something. But it's very easy to query. And if you just take like this network client thing example I used, you could even start dynamically adjusting your timeouts going, what was the response time of this API in the last 12 hours? Give me the average, do some like decision on it and, and roll and have your system adapt. So if your service provider is having a tough day, you're a bit more lenient on them before you time out. And so it's very easy to get your data out of it in a very useful way. It's really, I hope I can answer it. It felt no, a bit rambling. Not a like hundred percent concrete one. Um, an open example I try to use a lot is actually that prawn. Uh, memory leak that we solved with the, using the, the Java tooling at the time. It's like fantastic going through trying to build, like somebody reported like when I use porn in emails, I get a memory leak and this happens. I'm like, I'm seeing the same thing, but I don't send emails. So what are we doing? Like that's immediately like the, the we use prawn. I mean, that's about it's like we use Ruby. So, we tried to figure out and we started just chatting on the GitHub issue. We're like, oh, we're both using tables, and the people that couldn't simulate it weren't using tables in their PDFs. And that was a place to start looking and then start instrumenting and building up. We were, just, we were running blind, no idea, trying to get the smallest possible case. And then we start running it in, and you set an activity monitor on OSEX, and you just watch, and you're like, okay, this number is going up. So, and then you start jamming it into tools and start playing with it. Ask other people to verify, like, I've got this, just what's your chart looking like? And then they're like, I don't know how to do this. And you go to the engine yard block where they tell you how to measure memory with mem Eclipse Memory Analyzer. And you build up the stack like that. And we did this whole verify up and down, up and down step until we found objects, font objects being thrown in a hash but the objects themselves didn't have the Ruby hash method, so the same font, if you keep adding it to the hash, it just makes more and more and more and more objects. And that happened because they simply measured the size of an M character for the font, because it's generally the widest character to determine table sizes. It's the most weirdest, deepest like thing to get to, and it's this three-line fix, and boom, memory leak sorted in for two weeks. But it's, that was like up and down, verifying, and everybody learning Stuff, but it's, it's not that it, like we had a gut, we had no feeling whatsoever, and that was a great way also to explore this against the the biases. Um, I wanted to, what I wanted to do was to try and collect data from GitHub, but from different AWS regions, like make a little script and just run it in Singapore and like in South America and everywhere, and trying to just get an expensive query. But yeah, and I mean, the API times went down so much when I had that idea, the response times were like 200 milliseconds 
or like about the upper limit, and they dropped to 30. And the quick W gets I did was just, it's so consistent that what's going to end up happening is I'm going to measure the network latency all over the globe. And that didn't work. That's not going to be useful to an example. But um, yeah, I think it's always something else in our code. You need to get in there and measure. That's why I'm actually advocating the measure because it's like, see, I can't even conjure up a good example. I hope it kind of. Yeah, people had some idea. Maybe somebody else. Oh boy. Wait. I'm not going to be able to see that. It should be 420. Is that the first? I think that's the first one, but it's that's kind of a nice spot where you can just I hope it's this one if you start seeing charts and graphs and so on. There we go. That's a great one to go through. But this makes me feel nostalgic. There was a time when I can't remember who it was. I did all the memory profiling and who made Bleak House. They had some kind of blog post over and over again of getting in your code and answering these questions and stuff. But it's quite awesome that we can use everything that JVM has. I mean, Charles probably let our minds tomorrow with that <laughs> stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of it. Um, guys, if there's not any more questions, let me stop rambling. I think it's everybody wants to stretch their legs, take the epic walk to coffee, not get lost in the process. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for your time. I really like, I just, the takeaway is, measure stuff. Then you can also come up here and give great talks of how you made rails faster <laughs> um, or even just save your clients tons of money. And, like measure your stuff and think critically like our guts are wrong. Thanks.
Electro por la vida.